Hey guys, I'm back to redo my previous video that I messed up so badly I have to delete it. I, I even messed up on my own interview question that I like to use about body diodes in MOSFETs. Stupid, stupid, stupid. I may have to just unhire myself at some point. So I want to talk briefly about design considerations you might consider when you're designing a very low cost consumer product that needs to have reverse polarity protection on batteries or input jacks. And, because this is Nerd Thunder Month, there's going to be a couple links at the end of the video to other YouTube channels which I think are relevant to this topic and I think you'll enjoy taking a look at them. So as an engineer, you don't always get to work on the most glamorous projects like for instance this oscilloscope which would have hundreds of dollars worth of a bill of materials and a lot of flexibility as far as part selection. Sometimes you have to work on toys or something much smaller and highly constrained where your budgets might be one or two dollars for your bill of materials. Those are actually really fun or I really enjoy them because there's a lot of trade-offs that you have to make to maintain a fantastic user experience and hit your target budget. When it comes to protecting the input of your device, like through power jacks or batteries, it's kind of tricky. Um, there's some chips that are just magical that have everything you can want in them. They could do reverse polarity, over current, over voltage, they do power on reset. Downside to these particular devices is like even in high volumes, they can be anywhere from 25 cents to several dollars per device, depending on what features that you're looking for. But you always have options. I mean, one of your options is to just do nothing. Uh, you can make your system globally tolerant to whatever the end user is going to throw at you, which can be tricky. End users are usually, you know, innocent and and have best intentions, but they'll plug the wrong AC charger into your device, or they'll jam the batteries in backwards, or somehow wedge the wrong battery in. Um, so end users can be pretty rough on devices, and uh, you should be ready for that. So one of the, the simplest things that you can do is you can put a series diode on your inputs, and so that protects from reverse polarity. It comes with some pros and cons. There's a voltage drop across this diode and so if you're in a battery application for instance you may not be able to use your entire capacity of your battery because you're losing uh, several volts to this diode and that may not be a great user experience if your user has to go out and buy batteries all the time. If you're a high voltage or a high current uh, application that drop across the uh, diode may generate heat and that may cause thermal issues. So it's something to look at and uh, you know, crunch the numbers and make sure everything is, is appropriate before you go down that path. This one I like to call the explodey diode. And I've seen this quite a few times. This is where you can avoid that voltage drop by putting the diode across the inputs instead of in series. So what this means is when the end user plugs their external power source in or the batteries, it just dead shorts it. So that can mean for the batteries, you're just immediately you know, discharging them at full rate, which is kind of a bad user experience. Or if it's an external uh, power source, you could damage their power source, or you could even blow up this diode and take out your system anyway. So sometimes you'll see a, a, a fuse in here. So as soon as you plug in something incorrectly, it'll just blow the fuse. But again, that's not a great user experience. So I much prefer doing something like a PMOS diode-like device. And so the way this works is on your positive supply rail goes into the diode, the, the voltage flows through the body diode, and then your source starts to rise. And when your source rises, it goes negative relative, I mean, your gate goes negative relative to the source, which turns on the transistor. And these tra PMOS transistors are amazingly low resistance these days, so it's almost like having nothing in line and if you flip the polarity backwards, now your gate is higher than the source and the transistor will never turn on, and so your device is protected. These particular transistors are just pennies these days. 
So if you're going to do a high voltage system, you may want to take a look at the specs of your transistor and find out what the breakdown voltage of your gate is and make sure that at no point your gate can go too far negative and uh, you can end up burning a hole through your gate and shorting your gate out. To, to solve that, you can put a Zener diode, which is also a low cost device in here that makes just basically a, a very simple shunt regulator that keeps your gate from going too low. So this is the circuit that I was claiming did certain things and it didn't actually do it and this is where I was messing up because I was going too fast. So I redid the circuit and now it functions as I was claiming. So this part of the circuit is just the same as the previous circuit. This does the reverse polarity protection so we don't have to cover that. But there's a couple other components in here which are doing, doing current limiting. So I have a shunt resistor, I have a PNP transistor, I have a pull up resistor and I have a pull down resistor. It's making a resistor divider, and then this runs over to another p-channel device, which to its gate. And it is, as you remember, if the gate is negative, it's going to allow um, current to flow. So as current starts to flow through this, and as the current increases, the shunt is going to have more and more voltage drop across it. And once it gets to about 0.7 volts, current's going to start flowing from the gate at the base of the PMP transistor and it'll start conducting across this 50 ohm resistor in, in this case and it'll start to um, pull up the gate of the p-channel FET which will start to bring it into a linear region which will start to shut down the current that can flow into your your device and so you can have a feedback loop which controls the current depending on how you set up your shunt resistor and these pull down resistors so Something to consider on this is if you think that your device is going to go into current limiting, you need to make sure thermally this transistor is heat synced properly and you've sized it correctly. Um, I don't know if this is exactly the circuit you want to use if you, you're going to be constantly going into current limiting mode. This is more of a protection circuit. And, and a reason you may want to do this, first when you're developing the design, you're going to be dropping your scope probes onto the circuit and blowing up the design or you're going to give it to a, a software developer that's going to throw it on their desk and it's going to be sitting on top of a pile of loose change and it's going to be shorting out. Trust me, I've seen it quite a bit. Um, other thing is if you have other peripherals that might plug into this device that you need to supply power, you'll be surprised like paper clips will fall into the connectors, uh, kids will plug the wrong Thing. They'll stick a fork into a cartridge port, which I did when I was a kid. So it's nice to have things that keep um, your entire design from exploding uh, for no apparent reason when <laughs> stuff shorts out. So I put together this test rig here so we can examine this circuit. So down here is a breadboard with uh, that exact circuit on it. Up here is a voltmeter that's on the base of the transistor and we'll see this hit about 0.7 volts when uh, current starts flowing from the base. The scope is hooked up to the gate of the current limiting MOSFET and we're going to see that go negative um, when we power up and then this amp meter is going to show us how many amps are going into the circuit. So let me turn it on so I have power supply here. All right. So we can see that the gate is now dropped down, so it's negative. So here's ground, and this is negative. We can see that the base has virtually no voltage uh, drop across that shunt, so it's off at this point. And there's very little current uh, going into the circuit, just enough to run this LED. And so across the design, I put my self-destruct switch, and when I pull this, it's just going to short the, the output. And what we'll see here, let's take a look at the gate of the p-channel FET first. So when I short it out, it goes up. And so it's going into current limit mode. So it's starting to go into that linear region of the p-channel FET to start to cut the current. So let's take a look at what happens at the base of the PNP transistor. Yep, it's getting up close to 0.7 volts. That means that there's enough drop across the shunt resistor that the current's going to be flowing from the, the transistor and it's going to start to saturate and start to remove this 50 ohm 
resistor from the circuit. Let's look at the current. Okay, so the current is you know, about 80 milliamps right now with the particular shunts and resistors that I have in there. So it's limiting at 80 milliamps. I put a jumper on here that I can put in that will cut the um, shunt uh, resistor value in half, which should double the current that we see when it's in current limit mode. So now I just installed the shunt. Let's take a look at it. Yep, about double the current. All right, so now to prove that my circuit actually functions as I claimed it functioned in the last video, I'm going to take the two power connections and I'm going to reverse them. All right, reversed. Now we see the gate is positive, so it means that the P PMOS transistor is completely off. I have another LED inserted in here in the reverse direction, so if when I have reverse power applied, the LED should turn on, but it's not, so that means that the circuit is operating properly. And then let's take a look at the ammeter and see if it swings backwards when I pull the self-destruct. Nothing. All right, so the circuit works this time. So, sorry about the hiccup on my last video. It happens. So, the folks that I'd like you to go take a look at is Big Clive. Big Clive tears apart a lot of consumer electronics some of them are good, some of them are really bad, some of them are really cheap, and some are expensive. If you want to be a great engineer, take a look at what other people are doing. Big Clive has lots of commentary on various devices. Highly recommend it. Also, go check out EEV blog. So Dave Jones tears apart quite a few uh, devices as well. There's a lot to learn there, very much like Big Clive. So, all right. Thanks for watching.